evening, Flint Baptist Church. It is so good to see you guys here tonight. We have a special treat for you tonight. Our uh, major praise is going to be sharing some music that they're going to be doing for us next weekend. Uh, it's going to be a great weekend of worship and praise. That They've been working hard on it, and they just wanted to kind of give you all a little preview of that tonight. If you're joining us online, we're glad you're with us tonight. And we pray that God just does amazing things all over Flint Baptist Church campus tonight. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for all you do for us, for the blessings you give us. God, I thank you for these kids, and I pray, God, you'd use them tonight for your glory. God, sing through them and just uh, continue to impress upon them uh, the things that you'd have for them in their life. Thank you for the opportunity to gather here at this church, and I pray you'd watch over us and keep us safe and give us a great night. We ask this in the powerful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Put your hands together and welcome Major Praise.
Well, that was good, amen? Make plans next weekend, yes. Yes, make plans next weekend to be here for the Major Praise performance. Uh, it's going to be a great night. There's just a lot of acting, a lot of things going on there, uh, and some great singing, and we just look forward to that, amen? Uh, Y'all stand up. Let's sing this old hymn together. Lift up your voices. So amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. How once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Was grace that taught my heart to hear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear! The hour I first believed when. Shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. We've no less days to sing God's praise than. That's good singing. You may be seated. Um, I forgot to put my microphone on, so Billy's going to get it. So while he's doing that, would you turn to Revelation chapter 3? Revelation 3, and uh, I guess he's going to bring it. Where? Jacob has it. Does Jacob have it? Where is it? We're so professional around here. Here. You got it? No, I don't have it. There it is. Oh, so he didn't bring it to me. There we go. What do you want? Right here. You got it? Yes, sir. All right. Now, there we go. Okay. Turn me down a little because I'm going to get louder, I promise. Revelation chapter 3 is where we're at tonight. We had 500 for supper. Let's give our kitchen crew a big hand. Woohoo! There we go. Okay. Some announcements. First of all, don't forget that this coming Saturday we'll be uh, hosting a memorial service for Robbie Moses, a member of our church here in the auditorium. The visitation will be at 10 o'clock. The service will start at 11 and it's for... uh, guy I grew up with, went to school with, uh, named Robbie Moses. And uh, we're going to celebrate his life ne- next Wednesday. We will have Bible study in the Christian Life Center. Okay? So major praise will take over our stage, and they'll be doing rehearsals and doing blocking and all the stuff for their actors. So this is the time of year that we get to stay in the CLC. So y'all come for supper pick you out a good spot, stay there, and I will be over and be doing Bible study in the Christian Life Center. Y'all got that? Okay, so that's the 7 o'clock Bible study. Next Wednesday night, 
will be there. And then they will have Saturday and Sunday night, Major Praise will be doing their performance. And I know that y'all will all be there because it'd be a crying shame if a church our size had their children's program work so hard all year on a program and then the adults didn't show up for it. That'd be a crying shame, wouldn't it? So I'm taking names. <laughs> I am visually looking at every one of you, and I expect to see you, I'd say Saturday and Sunday night, to just encourage these kids and clap real loud for them. Amen? Uh, let's see what else is going on. Uh, Monday... At noon, we're letting the office staff off because all the schools are letting their kids out and they have kids at home to go see the two-minute eclipse. <laughs> Which is a big event. You know, I mean, boy, the conspiracy theorists are slobbering at the mouth over that one. Uh, but there will be an eclipse Monday, so Monday afternoon. If you need something, come Monday morning, not Monday afternoon. Uh, there is a car wash for the 4th, 5th, and 6th graders. We'll be washing cars on Saturday, April the 6th from 9 to 12. And we want to support those guys. They're uh, trying to earn money to go to preteen camp. And we're going to get our cars washed. And I'll have mine in line to get it washed. So y'all come on up and get your car washed. Uh, ladies, join us for Thrive Recap Bible Study starting next Wednesday. April the 10th at 6 p.m. in the Hope Building. This is your chance to experience some of the highlights of Thrive, the big women's conference we had, and learn how to thrive in your walk with Christ. Spots are limited. Register today at FBC, flintbc.net at events. And uh, Saturday, April 13th, I'm really excited about this. Our disaster relief program is one of the greatest ministries that we host at our church. It it helps people in times where they really desperately need help. And, but you got to be trained to be part of it. And the training is not hard. I, I'm yellow shirt trained. I've been through the training. It's not that difficult. And if you ever want to go and help with the disaster relief team, you need to come to this training. So I would encourage you, if you've ever thought about it and would like to, come to the training. I promise you, you're not going to get any dumber. So you might learn something. <laughs> and if you're already yellow shirt trained and you'd like to work with the feeding unit, this gives you that advanced training. Or if you'd like to do assessments and go into areas and help assess what is needed from our disaster relief team, that training will also be taking place. But you need to register online at flintbc.net at events that you're going to be here. It'll be from 9 to 3. Usually they have lunch and it's just a great, great program. And if you have any questions about it, then we have wonderful people that are state known. Ralph and Deborah Britt, which are right over there, uh, go over there and say, tell me a little bit about this. And they, 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 I promise you, they will help you out. Anytime you go to disaster relief, anything and mention Ralph or Deborah Britt, they all go, oh, we love them. We love them. And uh, so they're great. Now, let's see. Uh, also, mark your calendars. The 14th Sunday after church, which will be noon or later according to how long the sermon goes. But I'm, I'm having a church-wide deacons meeting back in the choir room. So I need to meet with the deacons. And this is a chance that if you're going, listen, I, I, I was a deacon, but I, I, I'll always be a deacon, but I want to be inactive. I don't want to be then... Would you please let Cameron Strange know, because we'll put you on the inactive list. If you have joined our church, but you're ordained as a deacon at another church, I would love for you to be there, because I would love, you've got to go through a process to become an active deacon at Flint Baptist Church. So if you would be interested in becoming one, I need to know that, because you may have joined, and I had no earthly idea that you were a deacon, and we need to know that, okay? So deacons meeting, the 14th in the choir room after church service. Easter weekend, Saturday night, Sunday morning, first service, Sunday morning, second service. Thank you for being kind and gracious in the parking lot, for not killing anybody. Nobody got run over that I'm aware of. 3,910 was the total number. Isn't that crazy? 
Had almost 4,000 people watching online, the services, Saturday night, Sunday morning, Sunday morning, and uh, listening on live stream. So that is incredible. I mean, that just blows my mind. Last year we had 3,500. This year we had 3,900 people that. Now, I realize some people came twice. Thank you. (laughs) And that's not 3,900 individual unique people, but it was 3,900 that were on this campus celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And, And isn't that amazing? Because the news will splash it all over the place that three spooks are down on the square trying to put a hex on somebody. But they'll never mention 3,900 people that came to a little town called Flint Baptist Church to worship the resurrection of Jesus. Amen. Tell me it's not biased. But that's okay. That's okay. The Lord knows where we were at and what we were doing, and we're going to make an impact. Amen. Just kind of letting you all know what I think. All right. Now, we're in Revelation chapter 3. I'm going to read a lot of Scripture, so please stand in honor of God's Word. We're going to finish up Sardis, and then we'll go into the first part of the church at Philadelphia. So listen to this. And unto the angel of the church at Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God, the seven stars. I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest, and art dead. Be watchful, and strengthen the things which remain, that are ready to die. For I have not found thy works perfect before God." Remember, therefore, how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt know what hour I will come upon thee. Thou hast a few names even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name in the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels." He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. So that's a letter to Sardis. And unto the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews, and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and to worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I will also keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Hold fast that which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. He that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall no more go out, and I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is the new Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Would you bow with me for a word of prayer? Father, thank you for your presence here tonight, for your willingness to teach us. God, the freedom that we have to open your word and to discuss it, to proclaim it, and to apply it to our lives. God, may we leave better than when we came in. May we be more committed. May we have a better understanding and appreciation for who you are. And God, we just pray your blessings over the many ministries that are going on right now. God, thank you for our children's choir. Thank you for those leaders, the the adults that give up their time to go back there and work with these kids. And God, that's, that's so great. Thank you for those working with Bible Drill. And God, for the many kids that, that qualified through the, um, uh, the Bible Drills, I, I thank you, God, for those that are being discipled right now down in the Student Center on your holiness. I thank you, Lord, for Nathan and Billy uh, rehearsing with our choir. They did a phenomenal job Sunday. God, I pray you'll be with those that are watching over our babies in the nursery. God, be with our RAs and GAs and mission friends. And and God, may you be glorified. Sink this message into our heart, Lord. And help us not forget it. And we will give you glory and praise. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. We've already looked at the first half 
of the letter of Sardis. We talked about how Sardis was located on a plateau that overlooked a cliff. They kind of spilled down into a valley. It was a very rich church. It was a very rich city. They were heavy in textiles. There was a lot of gold that was in the river that ran through the valley. And when they were attacked, the city would retreat up onto the plateau, and they felt like they were safe. But Sardis was known for not being watchful. On two separate occasions, with the Persians and with the Greeks, they did not set a sentry on the wall, and as a result, got overtaken because they were not watching. So the, the strong... Uh, message to the church is you need to be on watch and you need to remember. Uh, so remember our theories as we look at these seven churches, okay? Uh, one, it's Jesus is speaking to the actual church, amen? So the message is directed to that church and that's you're either doing well, you're great. Uh, and to Sardis he says, listen, you got a reputation that you're doing good, but the truth is you're dead. Uh, you got a reputation that you're alive, but you got one foot in the grave, one foot on a banana peel. <laughs> you're not doing good. Now, everybody around you thinks you're doing good, and you got big, pretty buildings, and you got big crowds, and everybody hollers amen, but the truth is, spiritually, you're dead. You're not doing what you're supposed to be doing. You're supposed to be evangelizing the world, and you're not doing it. So, quit living on past victories and, and on past reputations, and live today. Amen? What are you today? Well, that, that fellow at the funeral home, he was alive two days ago. He's not alive now. Well, he's got a reputation that he was alive, but he's dead now. So the question is, where are you spiritually? And that's what he was asking Sardis. He said, you, you got a reputation that you're good? You're not good. You, you're dead. Second, we also know that these seven churches could represent a different epoch or era of church history. And we talked about Ephesus being the apostolic age and going down to each of the ages. And if that were true, then the church at Sardis would be somewhere between 1520 A.D. and 1750, which, if you know, 1520, the fires of the Reformation were being ignited by Martin Luther and uh, other places in Europe, and the Reformation takes place, and that will take place from 1520 through about 1750 is kind of the age range that they put that in. Uh, but also, realize there are lots of theories concerning this, and you're going to hear a bunch of them as you study the book of Revelation. So it could be the actu it's the actual church. It could be epochs of church history that each of these seven churches represent. There are also theories that say each of the seven church, churches represent the seven personalities of existing churches. In other words, you've got some churches that are uh, lukewarm. You've got some that are doing great, they just left their first love. You, you've got some that have a reputation that they're doing great, but in essence, they're really dead. So they could represent seven different kind of churches. You may visit and go, lukewarm church, on fire church, suffering church, but doing great. So it could represent those seven churches. It could represent seven types of Christians that are in the church today. Some people are really on fire for the Lord. Some people are really suffering for the Lord. Some people are really lukewarm. Amen. It could represent seven different flavors of ice cream that can be found in the dairy section of a grocery store. I didn't know if you were really listening. I just thought I'd throw that in to see if. So there are a lot of different theories. And then there's another theory that says each of these seven churches correspond to the seven seals that are opened up in Revelation 6. So Ephesus would correspond with seal number one being opened up, and then you have Smyrna, and then you have Thyatira, and so each of those. And if that were true, and you won't further study on that, I would suggest that you get a book by Nelson Walters called Revelation Deciphered for further study and references. If you go, I really want to check into that. That's where you're going to get a whole lot more information about it. So if this is true, 
then we are coming to a very critical portion of the tribulation. If indeed these churches, these seven letters, represent the timing of the seven seals being opened up, then Sardis is the fifth seal. And that means it's the opening of the fifth seal in Revelation 6. And this is a time of severe persecution for Bible-believing, Jesus-loving Christians. The Antichrist will have desecrated the temple at the three-and-a-half-year mark, set up an image on Temple Mount. The false prophet is trying to kill all those that are not willing to worship the Antichrist. Now, if you go, I believe in a pre-trib rapture, great, we'll be out of here. But those that were saved after a pre-trib rapture are going to really be going through a tough time. But I just happen to believe that it will be the church and it will be going through a tough time. And you realize that when the fifth seal is open, the altar is raised up and there are the souls of them who have been martyred for the cause of Christ. And they say, how long, O Lord, holy and true, until you avenge our blood? And he says, a little while because some of your fellow servants still have to die. Christians are dying. They're giving their life for the faith. Now you go, oh, well, I can't believe that would happen. It's been happening for 2,000 years. There have been more Christians die in the past 100 years than in the previous 1,900 years. The church is under intense persecution in China right now. It's always been in persecution in Russia. And some of the third world nations, I'm telling you, if you proclaim to be a Christian, especially in a Muslim nation, Brother, you've taken your life into your hands. So, what does the Bible say at this time if it's in the fifth year, the abomination of desecration has taken place, there's, there's an attack on anyone that does not worship the image of the beast, those believers at that time are under severe persecution. What, does, what, what is the admonition to this church? Well, he says in Revelation 3, 2, Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found thy works perfect before God. Be watchful. Be on watch. We are to watch. And this echoes the same words that Jesus has in Mark 13, 32. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, talking about the rapture. No, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son nor but the Father. Take heed, watch, and pray, for you know not when the time is. For the Son of Man is as a man taking a far journey who left his house and gave authority to his servants, to every man to his work, and commanded the porter to watch. Watch, therefore. For you know not when the master of the house cometh, at evening or at midnight or at the cock crowing or in the morning, lest suddenly he come find you sleeping, and what I say unto you all is watch. He says like uh, the master, your master said, listen, I'm, I'm going over, away for a while. I'm not sure when I'm going to come back, but here are your chores. I want you to get your work done. And when I come back, I want to find you working. I want to find your chores having been done. Now, you don't know when I'm coming back. But I'm coming back, so you need to be aware that I'm coming back. Listen to the end of verse 3, Revelation 3, 3. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. So the language is the same as the language that Jesus gives in the Olivet Discourse. Listen to Matthew 24, 42. Watch ye therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord doth come, but know this, if the good men of the house had known at what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would have not suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore, be ye also ready for such an hour as you think not the Son of Man cometh. Watch. And then listen to Paul as he describes the day of the Lord or the coming rapture in 1 Thessalonians 5, 2. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a Thief in the night. And when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. You're all the children of the light and the children of the day. You're not of the night nor of the darkness. 
Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. How contrasting that is to the book of Revelation that says, If therefore you shall not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt know what hour I will come upon thee. And he's saying the same thing in 1 Thessalonians, saying the same thing in Mark 13, saying the same thing in Matthew chapter 24. So what does watch mean? Well, it does not mean just to stare at the eastern sky. Hey, brother Sam, no, I'm watching. Jesus says he's going to come back, he's going to roll back to Skies will scroll, and he's going to come back, and the trumpet's going to blow, and dead and Christ shall rise. And I'm supposed to be on watch, so I'm watching. I'm watching the eastern sky. I hope that's east. I'm, 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 that's not what that word means. It means to be aware, aware of the signs, aware of the events taking place. When I would stand watch in the Navy, you would have a fire and security watch, or you'd put you at the watch at the front gate, and you wouldn't just sit there and stare at the gate. But you were alert to anyone approaching the gate. You were alert to any car that would be driving up. And you were to remain alert. You were to go in there and go to sleep. You knew somebody was going to come eventually to the gate. So you were aware. Now, you didn't have to just stare at the gate the whole time. But you were very aware of your surroundings. And that's what he's saying. You need to be aware that the times are near. You, you, listen to what's happening in the Middle East. Be aware of what's happening in the news today and how that relates to signs given to us in the Bible. And it says, strengthen the things that remain. Uh, and, and this is, if indeed this goes with our theory that this is year five, right before the sixth seal is opened up, brother, it's at the door. I mean, the rapture's at the door. And he says, strengthen those things that remain. In other words, he says, if there's ever a time to get serious about your Christianity, now's the time. If if you've been that person saying, you know, I'm going to have a prayer life. I'm going to get around to it. brother, Brother, you better go ahead and get around to it. Because the time's really drawing short. Strengthen those things that remain. If you're ever going to be benevolent, If you're ever going to give something, if you're ever going to start a Bible study, this is the time. Because when the heavens scroll back and Jesus appears, it's too late. You can't do it tomorrow. Everything you have is left behind. So if God's ever led you, you better do it. Strengthen those things that remain because time is getting really short. Time to get serious. You know, I think the biggest problem in our church today is not that people don't want to get serious about the Lord. They're going to get serious about the Lord. It's just not today. I'll start tomorrow. I'll be generous tomorrow. Next week, when I retire, when I make a million dollars, then I'll be benevolent. Then I'll be kind. Then I'll be great. Then I'll give. Then I'll support. I think that's the kind of person to be one day too left, too, too, uh, too late, one day too late. And you'll stand before God and go, wow, what opportunities I've missed. And then he comes and he says, we need to remember. So verse 3, remember, therefore, how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. Uh, Miss Marilyn Welch reminded me of of a word in the English grammar. It's called a polysynduton, daton. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it. It's a Greek term that is defined as the deliberate insertion of conjunctions into a sentence for the purpose of slowing up the rhythm of the prose so as to produce an impressively solemn note. So, in other words, any time that you see in the English language and that conjunction and, A and D, used over and over and over again, it's trying to get you to slow down and to look at each word. So the scripture would read, remember therefore how thou hast received, stop, and how thou hast heard, stop, 
and hold fast, stop, and repent. So it want, it don't want you to just run right through it, slow down. You didn't remember the things that you've received. That when times get tough, that you're a recipient, that you have received a priceless salvation. Amen. <laughs> Amen. That you're the recipient of the Holy Spirit. That he dwells within you. That when you were saved, you were gifted with the presence of the Holy Spirit. You need to remember what you have received. That you have received the gift of complete, absolute forgiveness. That you have received the knowledge of the mystery of God. That you have received forgiveness. That you have received the adoption into the family of God. That you have received redemption. That you have received access to the throne of Almighty God. That you have received dunamis, the power of Almighty God. The wonder-working power of the Lord God. Remember what you've received. It's like a child leaving the Christmas. You got an ice cream cone, they fall, and you go, oh, and you're going, whoa, whoa, whoa. You just received $500 worth of Christmas presents. You received more in one Christmas morning than I got all my childhood. Don't you cry, I'll give you something to cry about. It's going to get tough. You better remember what you are and who you are and what you received, what you got. That you got a Bible. You've had a Bible in your hands all your life. That's something some people could only dream about. In the days of Jesus, if you had one book of the Old Testament, you had to be almost filthy rich because every single jot and every single tittle had to be painstakingly copied by hand. And you've got it. You've got it in 15 versions. Remember what you've received, what you got. Don't let go of that. Hold fast to that, what you've got, because the devil's going to try to remind you what you don't have, and you need to remember what you got. You remember what you've heard. Remember what you've heard. Didn't that just thrill you, Sunday? That great sermon preached by Brother Sam. If y'all don't amen me, listen, I'm going to start amening myself. I mean, we oftentimes talk about the crucifixion, and, and that's phenomenal. And we talk about the resurrection, and that's phenomenal. I don't know that I'd ever preached a sermon on what happened between the crucifixion and the resurrection. To know that you heard that Jesus Christ went down and proclaimed victory to those that were in the bottomless pit. That he proclaimed that he paid for all your sins and had nailed them to the cross and triumphed over those that were in the abyss, those wicked, wicked entities that would love to destroy you. Remember what you've heard. Remember the things you've heard about Jesus, your Christ. Remember the things that you've heard. Don't let it be like most Baptists to go in one ear and right out the other. There may be a day that you don't have that Bible in your hand. Remember what you've heard, that Jesus defeated death, hell, and the grave. And because he rose, we shall rise too. And you can take my body, but you can't take my soul because I'm in love with Jesus. And greater is he that is in me than he is in the world. And you've got to remember what you've heard. And then the Bible says, and hold fast, and hold fast. That word in the Greek means to prevent from escaping. Don't let what you've heard and what you've received get away from you. Don't let it get away from you, guys. So then we get to the reward, and this is great. Listen to verse 4. Thou hast a few names even in Sardis which have not defiled their garments. And they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And I will not blot out his name in the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and his angels. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. So a couple of things. First, the overcomer, the Christian, will be clothed in white raiment. 
So if you're a Christian and you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, when you get to heaven, don't go, well, I'm going to wear blue. I'm going to wear purple. I'm going to wear maroon. I'm the maroon Christian. You're going to wear white. The white clothing certainly represents righteousness. Not our righteousness. That's just filthy rags. It's that we've received the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ. And that's the white garments we'll be wearing. We see that it's given to the faithful in Sardis. We also see white robes given to the martyrs under the altar in the opening of the fifth seal. The Bible says white robes were given unto them. Again, we see it in Revelation 7, verse 8. After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man can number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hand. I believe that is the rapture church. Uh, the bride at the marriage supper of the Lamb will be clothed in white raiment, as well as the armies that follow Christ back in Revelation chapter 19. The Bible says Jesus is on a white horse. All of his armies are on white horses, and they will be dressed, clothed in white raiment. So we're going to be clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen? That's pretty good. Second thing I would say is listen to the comment to the overcomers. And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. Now, some people would come back and say, aha, if Jesus will not blot out the name of an overcomer, does that mean if we fail or if we give in, then our names will be blotted out of the book of life? No, Jesus didn't say that. You're trying to make the Scripture say something it did not say. He simply says to the overcomer, to the person that stays the course, I will not blot out your name. Doesn't say anything about those that don't overcome, I'm going to blot their name out. He just says to those that are overcomers, I will not blot out your name. Nothing more should be assumed because nothing more is said. I know you want to say it, but don't. Because you're making it say something it's not saying. He that has an ear, let him hear, hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. What's the Holy Spirit telling you? What are you hearing from the Holy Spirit? What's he saying to you? Don't let it go. Hold fast to it. God put something in your heart and in your mind. Hold on to it. That which you've received, that which you have heard, hold fast. Amen? Okay, good. Y'all got that. Now, let's go on to the church of Philadelphia. And y'all know Philadelphia means the city of brotherly love. Phileo is a word in the Greek language that means love, but it means brotherly love. Uh, it's how it's often translated. It, it's agape love is basically an unconditional love. And it's defined by Kenneth Weiss as being, looking at an object as being precious in your sight. Okay? And, and I, I'm going to love it because I believe it's precious. Irregardless of the circumstances, I shall love. And that's how we're supposed to love each other. That's how God loves us, so forth and so on. Phileo, though, is a different type of love that says, I derive pleasure from this. So it would be defined as saying, I love ice cream. I get pleasure from licking an ice cream cone. That's a phileo type love. It's a condition. I like this. It brings me pleasure. Now, we can phileo enjoy each other's company. I really enjoy being with you. And that would be a brotherly love, okay? But I also should agape you that I should see you as being precious in my sight, irregardless of whether I get much pleasure out of it or not, I should still determine to, as an act of faith and an act of will, love you. I choose to love you. Even when you're not very lovable, I choose to love you and seek your very best good. Y'all got that? So that's what Philadelphia means. Unto the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, these, say, these things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth and shutteth and no man openeth. So look at the characteristics of Christ. First of all, he that is holy. Now the word holy means without blemish, completely pure. And of all the startling characteristics of God that when you first see God, I believe the first thing that will really jump out at you is going to be his holiness. Hannah, 
After she had had Samuel, God had answered her prayer. She had the prophet Samuel. She was going to give him back to Eli to be raised in the tabernacle. Hannah prayed after that saying, there is none as holy as the Lord. That's a great prayer. Amen. We're reminded that the overwhelming characteristic of God is holiness. In Isaiah chapter 6, the Bible says that Isaiah, in the year the king Uzziah died, saw the Lord high and lifted up on the throne of God. And the Bible says that he saw the seraphim cease not in the temple of God, crying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. So without ceasing in heaven, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, is the cry, Holy, holy, holy. Now, is he merciful? Yes, he is. Is he loving? Yes, he is. But above all things, the one thing, the seraphim are crying out, and we see this again in Revelation chapter 4, that the four beasts that surround the throne cease not day and night crying, Holy, 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 holy. And it's amazing that anybody that sees a manifestation of God immediately is struck by the holiness of God and falls flat on their face. Isaiah 6, what did Isaiah say? Unclean, unclean. I'm a man of unclean lips. In, in, in comparison to your holiness, I am so filthy. I am so unclean. Jesus Christ is holy. Even the demons recognize the holiness of Jesus Christ. Mark chapter 1 Jesus goes to a synagogue. I think this is one of the funniest scenes because he goes to a local church, house of worship. And if this were to break out at Flint Baptist Church, I'm telling you, we'd have some challenges. Our security team would be on the radio, just letting you know. And there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. And he cried out saying, leave us alone. What are we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us or literally send us into the deep? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. I know who you are. You're the Holy One of God. Even the demons recognize him. He tells the church of Philadelphia, I am he that is holy. But he's also true. This word for true means genuine, authentic, the real deal, in contrast to a fake or counterfeit. Jesus is the one and only Messiah. Amen? He's the genuine Messiah. Anything that comes after him is going to be a fake or counterfeit. And the Bible says in the last days, there are going to be a lot of deception and a lot of counterfeits and a lot of fake messiahs. He said they're going to be in that corner, in that corner, on that YouTube channel, on, on this TV screen, all over the place. Don't believe them. Don't go after them. Because there's one genuine, one true Messiah promised by Almighty God, and his name is Jesus, and he is true, and he is faithful The Bible says that Jesus is the true light. His words are faithful and true. He is the true bread. He is the true vine. He is the real deal. He is the genuine article. There will be no other like him. And then the Bible says Jesus holds the key of David. Uh, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. This is a quote from Isaiah twenty two twenty two. So we ask ourselves, what is this key? It seems to be the key to a door or a portal or a passageway that Jesus has opened and no man can shut. And once it's shut, no one can reopen it. In fact, the phrase is repeated in verse 8 where the Bible says, I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, thou hast kept my word and has not denied my name. So he, he says there's this door that when I open it, no man can shut it. When I shut it, no man can open it. So, I have three thoughts on this, and I think then I'll be close to being done. Yeah, I'm close. All right. First, Jesus sets before us an open door, opportunities of service that no man nor all the demons in hell can close. What a great thought. Amen? Do you realize that right now, if you're a parent of a, an 11-year-old, that God has opened a door for you to influence this 11-year-old's life? 
And once they turn 12, that door's closed. You can't influence an 11-year-old again. You can go to a 12-year-old, but the influence you have with them at 5 or 4, that's an open door that God gives you. When, When God calls you in your heart and says, I want you to support a ministry, that's an open door. That may not be there tomorrow. When he says, I need you to help teach the the second grade boys, that's an open door. That all the demons in hell can't shut. But if you say, no, I'm not going to do it, it may be shut. We often tell people that come to our office, "What, what should I do? We say, look for God to open my door. When I was a youth minister at R.P. Manuel, People would say, I thought you were going to pastor. I said, I, you know, I feel called. I, I feel that's my calling is God's going, but he hadn't opened the door yet. So I don't want to go opening the door, you know, and try to knock doors down. I want him to open the door. And, and one Saturday morning, this guy called me. And he said, hey, we want to come hear you preach. I said, man, you got the wrong number. I'll give you the preacher's number. I'm just a youth minister. I'm low, man. No, I didn't say I was low. But I said, and he said, no, no, we've heard that you can preach. And we overheard a conversation that was taking place in a pharmacy, and the pharmacist butted in the conversation and said, if you're looking for a preacher, I know a good guy that's out at ARP. His name is Sam DeVille. <laughs> I didn't send him a resume. I didn't send him anything. And he just called and said, we heard you could preach. We'd like to hear you preach. And God opened that door. He opened the door. I didn't knock it. I didn't open it. I didn't know where the church was. In fact, it took us, that was before the days of GPS. It took a long time to find the church. But God will open doors for you, but he'll also shut those doors. I I remind you that the children of Israel were prepared, they were protected, they were delivered, they were provided for, they were married at the Mount of God. God gave them the law, he gave them the Ten Commandments, he, 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 you know, everything that we've been talking about on Sunday morning and, and it's all to lead them to the promised land. They get to Kadesh Barnea to the promised land. He, they send in 12 spies, spy out the land, come back, give us a report. They came back, give a report. And God said, okay, let's go. I've got the angel of the Lord that's going to lead you. I'm going to put fear into their hearts. I'm going to put bumblebees to chase them out of their cities. Man, I'm going to bless you. And, and they went, no, we're not going to go. The door is open. Go. No, not going to go. God goes, okay, you don't want to go? Then you'll wander in the wilderness for the next 40 years. Anybody over the age of 20 will not go into the promised land except for two people, and those were the two spies that gave positive reports, Caleb and Joshua. The rest of you, no, not going in the promised land. Uh, Okay, we changed our mind. We changed our mind. We, we're going to go. Doors closed. Well, we're going to go anyway. You do? You're going to get slaughtered. I won't go with you. They went in the next day. Their armies got slaughtered. And then they watered in the wilderness for 40 years. The door was open. Next day it was closed. Nobody's guaranteed you tomorrow. If God's asked you to do it and the door's open... Go through the door. Because once it shuts, no man can shut it. All the demons in hell can't open it back up. I would say the second thing that I would look at on this is this could very well be the rapture. That God opens the door to heaven. We take off, travel through the door to heaven. He calls, the trumpet blows. Here we go. Because this is the sixth seal. This is the sixth church. The sixth church, or I believe the rapture occurs after the opening of the sixth seal. Because that's the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord occurs after the sun goes black, moon turns blood red. When the sixth seal is open, the moon turns black, and the moon turns blood red. Get my tongue tied. And now here he is saying, I've opened the door. That all the demons in hell can't close. No man can close it. But when I shut it, too sad, too bad. 
Here we all go. Oh, Jesus, I changed my mind. I, I should have responded during the invitation. I knew I was lost. I knew I should have gone down there and given my heart to Jesus and been baptized. But I changed my mind. Okay, Lord, come in my heart. I want you to save me. I want you to forgive me all my sins. I'm going to get in the baptistry. I'm going to wallow around in there a good while. And, and, and okay, now I'm ready to be raptured. Too late, door's closed. Two will be in the field. One will be taken, one left behind. He says when the rapture occurs, don't even think about going in your house and gathering up your jewelry or your gold coins or your diamonds or your money. No, 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 no. Go, you better go through the door. And what's he saying here? I'm going to open the door and no man can shut it before. So I shut the door and no man can open it. Listen to this. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee. He says, there are a group of people that call themselves Jews, that call themselves the people of God, that say they have a relationship with God, but they lie. They really don't. They're not the descendants of Abraham because Abraham was a man of faith. So they are not. They're lying. But there's going to come a change at this sixth church, at this sixth seal opening up. There's going to come a change that before they thought the church was wrong, y'all are wrong, Jesus isn't the Messiah, but now they're going to worship beside your feet. Huh. Well, what happens after the opening of the sixth seal? Well, the Bible says that Jesus appears in the sky. And all the lost people, whether in high station or low station, will hide themselves in the mountain. And then what happens in chapter 7? 12,000 of each of the 12 tribes of Judah suddenly, suddenly get sealed with the seal of God. In other words, say, I guess the church was right. And you see this huge change take place like they say is taking place here. Pretty interesting, huh? Yeah, I think so too. All right, let me end with this, 759. And last, understand something. Whether you agree or disagree or whether, you know, that's in your, in your own heart. But let me, let me say this. This is meant to wow you. You understand that? I mean, this scripture is meant to blow your mind. It's meant to blow your mind. Christ is holy. Wow! Completely without blemish. Absolutely without sin. There, there is no bad intention toward. He seeks your very best good. You may not understand it, but you always know he is holy and always seeks your very best good. So much so he died on the cross so that you'd be saved and reconciled to God the Father. He is holy. Boom. He is true. He is the genuine article. There's not going to be anybody else. If you're going to follow, if you're going to follow one, you better follow him. He is true. Wow, wow, wow. He holds the key to the door of our salvation. He opens the door for the rapture, whether it's at the sixth seal, the first seal, the third seal, fifth seal, eighth seal. He holds the key. Wow. How do I know? How do I know these are wow? Well? Listen, listen. Oh, you ready? Revelation 3 9. Behold, poof. I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold! I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee, the church. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I will also keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold! I come quick. There is no other letter that has three beholds. This is a, this is a three behold. This is a triple behold. I mean, man, this is good. If you're going to look for beholds, this is the letter to look for. Something great is taking place when this sixth letter is written. And God's trying to get your attention with three separate individual behold. Grab you by the lapels. Behold, I come quickly. Are you watching? Are you ready? Are you holding those things? Are you making final preparations? Have you done those things that God's asked you to do? Have you walked through the doors God's asked you to walk through? 
or you just have the reputation, but nothing to back it up with. Behold, I come quickly. Hold fast that which thou hast, that no man may take thy crown. I hope you have received, heard, and will guard closely the scriptures that the Lord has taught us tonight. Blessed be the reading of his word. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Father, thank you for how you grab our attention. God, it makes us want to take our shoes off, the standing on holy ground. It makes us want to fall flat on our face to think of your holiness. God, that your face shines as the sun. God, that there is no blemish, there is no sin, there is no iniquity, no transgression to be found in all of who you are, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And God, all that you've done for us, all that we have received, God, may we not forget. Because we tend to put our eyes on the one thing that's wrong and forget all the wonderful blessings that you have blessed us with. God, forgive us. God, help us to hold fast that which we have heard, which we've received. And God, guard it jealously to your glory and honor, God. For it's in Jesus' precious name I pray. Amen. God bless you guys. You are dismissed. It's done. Go. Thank you so much for joining us today with online worship. If during this service you made a decision to renew your relationship with Christ, or if you have a special prayer request, please click the contact button or visit our webpage and share what's on your heart. Our staff prays for these requests every Monday morning, and we'd love to hear from you. You can also find previous sermons, Bible studies, and information about Flint Baptist Church through our website. We are simply a local church that is committed to serving Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Walk with us as we follow in Jesus' footsteps.